Welcome to this edition of Spider Presents, where we're speaking about avian influenza, also commonly known as the bird flu. This is Spider Presents, a series produced by the Spider Podcast Hub. My name is Laura Guzman. And mine is Ed Hill. In recent months, there has been noted concern at the negative health burden being suffered by numerous avian species due to highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks, which were referred to by its acronym HPAI. In Great Britain, since the 1st of October 2022, and up to the time of recording in March 2023, there has been over 170 confirmed cases of HPAI of the H5N1 subtype on poultry premises. There has also been several hundred confirmed cases in wild birds, spanning a range of waterfowl, seabirds and birds of prey. To prevent bird flu and mitigate its spread within the domestic poultry industry, certain actions have been taken. One such action has been housing orders, brought in within England from the 7th of November 2022 and within Wales from the 2nd of December 2022. In this episode of Spider Presents, we will speak to multiple guests who can offer an international perspective on this situation and its implications for wild bird conservation efforts and poultry owners. For this special episode of Spider Presents, we welcome Diane, Ben, Amandine, and Marie-Cécile. I'm Diane Prosser of the U.S. Geological Survey's Eastern Ecological Science Center. I'm a research wildlife biologist, and uh, my background is in avian and wetland ecology, spatial modeling. So I like to pull together field data and modeling approaches to answer questions related to wildlife stressors, such as disease, climate change, restoration, land use change. Hi, I'm Benjamin Golis. I am a veterinarian and quantitative disease ecologist between U.S. Geological Survey and Colorado State University. And my research largely involves trying to pull individual health statistics to scale up to inform on population and up to global levels of inference. Hi, I'm Amandine Gamble. I'm a research fellow at University of Glasgow and at Cornell University. Um, I look at uh, what are the drivers of uh, infectious disease transmission between species, so whether it's between humans and wildlife or uh, two different wildlife species or wildlife and domestic animals. Um, and for that, I use mostly field studies and um, looking at the ecology of the different species involved. Hello, I am Marie-Cécile Dupas. I am a postdoc researcher at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, Free University of Brussels. And uh, I am working on the spatial modeling of uh, livestock and uh, also wild birds to address some questions uh, on epidemiology uh, risks transmission. Thank you all for joining us today. It's, it's fantastic to have such a range of expertise all in, all in the room at the same time. So just to open up, um, there's some terminology around this area. So we hear about this high pathogenic avian influenza. There's also low pathogenic avian influenza. And then this particular interest in this H5N1 subtype. So could it be described, say, what's the difference between high pathogenic influenza and low pathogenic influenza? Low pathogenic or high pathogenic informs us on how badly an individual would be impacted um, if it's infected with the virus. So, for instance, we uh, very often hear about high pathogenic avian influenza. So that's usually the cases where if the virus arrived in, uh, for instance, a poultry farm, you might observe lots of uh, chicken, uh, ducks uh, getting sick and eventually dying. On the other hand, we have low pathogenic avian influenza, which usually doesn't cause... um, much disease, even when it infects a bird, so you can have uh, LC carriers. With that said, it doesn't mean that every bird infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza will get sick and die. We can also have uh, potentially some asymptomatic carriers, but that's um, like the kind of question we're actually investigating at the time, and it's, uh, you know, hard to give a a clear cutoff. That raises a very important area. There can be uncertainty uh, within the epidemiology and infectious disease dynamics. Yeah, lots of uh, uncertainty and lots of heterogeneity, whether like the way different individuals would respond to an infection or whether it's an individual scale or different species in different contexts. Uh, so for instance, whether they're also exposed to other stressors and so on. That's great. Thank you. And currently in Great Britain, it's the H5N1 subtype that's been causing uh, this substantial like, morbidity and mortality within both domestic poultry and wild birds. What, what is this HNN and what is this subtype classification system? 
that's in use. So there are two surface um, proteins on the outside of the virion. Uh, H stands for the hemagglutinin and N for the norominidase. And uh, the H helps the virus um, virion enter its host cell and the N helps it exit the host cell after it reproduces. Um, but they're important uh, terms because it's how we uh, name them or identify them. So, for example, what you had mentioned, the H5N1, so it's a, a hemoglutin type 5 and a norminidase type 1, so it helps us name them. This H5N1 subtype specifically, I guess there's been kind of a notable interest that over recent years, would someone be able to just give a, kind of a very short uh, kind of history, like when did this subtype kind of initially emerge as a concern? So I come from the wildlife perspective, so as like many, um, and more specifically from the seabird perspective, so, you know, I've been hearing about avian influenza for years, but it's really only the last year that uh, it became a focus in, in my field. Um, so what I understood, which might be a bit biased and, uh, you know, maybe not at the, the top of the current knowledge, but um, it, that the there's a, a virus strain. Um, so we can call the virus with the H and the N, um, as we just mentioned, but we can also um, call the different clades of the virus, like we also do with SARS-CoV-2. So there's one clade that uh, emerged in... Um, we think in a poultry farm in China in the mid 90s. Um, and it's like a virus uh, isolate that was um, uh, obtained from um, geese, I think, uh, in that area. And it's been circulating in poultry farm uh, across uh, Asia and eventually reached Europe uh, with a few spillovers, so transmission events between uh, farms and wildlife. Uh, mostly in like ducks and geese and things like that for, you know, about 30 years now. Um, and this year, for reasons that are still um, unclear to me and I think unclear to the community uh, in general, the scientific community in general, um, the this uh, clade of the virus um, created a huge outbreak. So we, we used to have outbreaks here and there, but this year was the biggest outbreak that Europe has ever uh, known, I think, for highly pathogenic avian influenza. And I think it's also one of the biggest that has uh, ever been recorded in North America. Um, and from the wildlife perspective, the I would say the, the shocking uh, event is that it um, spread to a seabird population and it caused... Uh, by billions of uh, deaths um, in seabird populations, notably in Northern Europe. That's right. And so with the situation of this global impact that's being suffered across both wild bird species and potential implications for domestic poultry industry, uh, given the range of international perspectives we, we have on the show today, uh, perhaps I'd like to now turn to Diane and Ben to offer their view of the current situation within uh, the USA, perhaps across North America at this time. Yeah, great. Uh, so this H5 uh, virus first entered the United States in 2014, 2015, and it um, was detected in wild birds and poultry for a short period of time, but then ended up dying out and things were quiet until um December 2021, when there was a detection in Newfoundland, Canada, and then very soon after, the first detections in the United States were um, along the Atlantic coast in the Carolinas, um, two detections in wild, uh, wild waterfowl. And since then, um, the virus has spread across all four flyways um, and has been detected in many wild bird species. It's been uh, detected in poultry farms. Um, it's the largest outbreak that we have seen. And we look back towards Europe because it seems like the, the patterns that, that we are seeing might be a couple steps behind what Europe has seen over the past year or so. But the viral genetics um, show that this virus likely came across the Atlantic Ocean um, from Europe over into um, the northern Atlantic flyway of, of North America. I might just add that it's kind of interesting that uh, the North American introduction in this instance came from the Atlantic coast, because we often think of in previous 
uh, investigations of the origins of high path avian influenza coming to North America. We think of it as uh, more Pacific flyways that intersect with uh, Eastern Asia up in the high northern breeding grounds of a lot of the waterfowl that we believe act as reservoirs for these viruses. And so it's a uh, I imagine threw a lot of people for a loop when uh, it was coming from the other side of the country originally, um, but now it's pretty ubiquitous throughout on a longitudinal scale. Many thanks for that very like, comprehensive overview of the situation. And within your own roles within USGS, uh, would you like to expand on um, their remit or their scope, their ambitions for like helping tackle the HPAI problems? Sure. Uh, within USGS, we try to provide science that helps inform um, management decisions. And so my role from back in the mid-2000s um, in relation to this disease question is trying to understand how wild birds might be involved um, in the spread of the H5N1 virus. Uh, when there was the first emergence in 1998, um, in the Guangdong geese, but then um, in 2005 at Qinghai Lake uh, in China was a first large-scale die-off in wild birds. And so that immediately brought the question of, um, can wild birds spread it? And, and then after 2005, it spread out of Asia uh, into Europe and then um, down into Africa in the following years. Uh, so, but there, at that time, there was very little information on migratory connectivity of wild birds, on their susceptibility to the virus, on how different species might react to it. So, those are some baseline questions that, um, when I came into this realm, um, started to try and help answer. And now we have a large global spread um, and also incursion into North America and South America. So, we're seeing some different patterns. Um, it seems like uh, waterfowl that often are reservoirs of low path and non-lethal forms of virus, they're being detected, but we're seeing large die-offs in other taxa, such as uh, seabird species, as well as raptors, some of the scavenging type species. So to help answer some of these questions and how wild birds might be involved or, or impacted by um, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses, we have multiple tools or studies that we've been trying to employ to answer these questions um, and that also are important inputs for um, modeling approaches. So one would be understanding migratory movements and um, seasonal patterns of uh, the, the main reservoirs, which are waterfowl or other water birds. So there we are able to use telemetry studies or GSM um, cell phone studies where we're able to track individuals and look in high resolution spatial and temporal scale. What are their movement patterns? Um, where are their wintering areas? Where are their breeding areas when they move across the landscape? So if they are reservoirs of low path viruses, and the question is how they may or may not be able to spread the high path viruses, where would you find them on the landscape at different times of the year? Uh, what is their spatial and temporal relation to different risk factors, um, uh, water bodies where virus might be able to survive in the environment? So the traditional route of transmission is through the fecal to oral route, where birds might be congregating in shallow waters, they're feeding, and but they're also defecating in that space. So they may be exposed to, to uptake of a virus. So understanding where they are, um, and during what time of the year is important, especially if you wanted to understand movement of the viruses and other risk factors, for example, at the interface between wild birds and domestic birds, uh, where virus could um, eventually move into a poultry system and cause large economic uh, losses. So one, basic ecology information on spatial and temporal movements of birds, also, um, partnering with uh, labs where um, different species might be challenged with uh, some of the virus isolates. And that's because a bird is not a bird as, how, as far as how it might be impacted by the virus. So, for example, a dabbling duck, such as a mallard that you might see in your local pond or a local wetland, um, may be able to survive uh, infection well and, uh, and then be able to move virus 
across the landscape, uh, whereas other taxa such as geese or swans, you know, part of the population may die off. Um, so there's a, you know, a difference in how much virus might be shed by a species and how they might be affected. Um, and so those are studies that would have to be done along with a BSL-3 lab, secure lab, where um, these, these virus studies could take place. Another really important tool is looking at the genetics of different virus isolates, and that way we can learn about virus evolution. We can also learn about potential um, transmission across species or across to um, the domestic interface. Um, but that's really important information in understanding and linking uh, between the wild bird reservoirs and or, or the wild bird hosts and um, uh, the virus dynamics. Um, another tool is to look at the broad scale surveillance and globally it depends where you are and how much surveillance is done, whether it's passive surveillance or active surveillance. Um, in North America, in the United States, we have an active um, surveillance program that is led by the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, but it's a multi-agency effort with a Department of Interior involved in many states. And uh, there, there are protocols uh, for numbers of samples that would happen across the landscape and across different seasons. And that way we can uh, see what types of viruses or avian influenza viruses are present and look for uh, incoming high path viruses. And just, just to clarify that, the BSL level with us like biosecurity level and those level facilities, there would be kind of, would that be few and far between? There wouldn't be many of those with that status? That's right. Um, they are, they have to have high certification. Thanks, Dan, for the summary of giving insight to perhaps the extensive amount of like field work and data collection that USGS is involved in. And so another aspect is then the use of like, modeling to help inform perhaps like surveillance efforts or the use of a limited number of resources or to get a sense of what are the possibilities of what might occur looking forward. And so Ben, you, you have an experience with uh, within the modeling background and is there uh, kind of current work that uh, you're involved in that you would like to expand on? Sure. So uh, our goal is we want to be able to tell poultry producers where and when they should be concerned about potential spillover from wild birds into domestic poultry flocks uh, because an infection of high path avian influenza in a given poultry flock is a devastating occurrence for the producer. They have to depopulate as a matter of protocol. So to help inform them, we're trying to develop models of the uh, international spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza among wild waterfowl. And there's an issue there where we are, we need to know uh, where a very large number of birds are and where they are going and their habits. And uh, that is a very difficult thing to predict on a large scale. And uh, one of the ways that we're trying to tackle that is by uh, pulling together many different sources of information from the individual level, uh, even on an energetics scale, to inform on bird behavior and uh, physiological limitations of migration. And then at the larger scale, looking at landscape patterns, weather patterns that might influence migration and trying to tie together all these uh, disparate sources of information to try to create uh, better prediction models of what we can expect avian influenza to do in the wild. Moving from there uh, south into kind of the southern hemisphere and South Americas and to Amandine's work and involving work in the Falkland Islands, which is very interesting. Uh, would you like to expand on the field work you've been undertaking in that area? Yeah, so I, I work in uh, in the Antarctica and Southern Ocean, uh, broadly speaking, and there is a uh, lots of concern there because there are huge uh, seabird populations and there are important uh, populations um, for like biodiversity because we have lots of endemic species, uh, lots of very isolated population. Um, there is a bit of speculation on whether some of those birds have seen any uh, avian influenza virus before and whether they could be, you know, maybe more uh, susceptible because they're naive to the, an infection like that. Uh, so my work uh, in, uh, in the Southern Ocean and so more specifically in the Falkland Islands is to try to 
assess the risk of uh, the virus being introduced uh, to the islands um, and what would be the consequences of uh, this introduction and how we can maybe help mitigate them. So it's obviously really hard to mitigate um, the spread of a virus in, uh, you know, uh, migratory birds and huge populations like that. Uh, but there are still things we can do at least to make sure we reduce uh, our contribution or potential contribution as humans. So for instance, implementing biosecurity uh, measures, uh, especially when we consider the scientists and tourists who are doing lots of back and forth between the Falklands and the rest of the world. And yeah, the other thing we are looking at, as I was mentioning, is whether um, the birds that are in Antarctica and in the Southern Ocean have ever been exposed to avian influenza before, so potentially low pathogenic avian influenza, because if that's the case, that could be uh, one of the explanations why some species or some individuals um, are more impacted than others. So for instance, if a bird has encountered low pathogenic avian influenza before, it might have antibodies that would contribute to protect it against an infection uh, with uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. So that's at this stage are very speculative. And so what we are doing concretely is uh, collecting uh, samples from birds there um, to see yeah, what, what kind of protection they may have. If we don't find any antibodies, we'd be very worried that if the virus comes, it might you know, um, spread very quickly through the population. If we find antibodies, we'll say, oh, maybe <laughs> they are protected, but we won't know for sure because uh, uh, it's a very complex question how uh, different um, antibodies against different avian influenza strains cross-react. Um, the reason why uh, this work right now is um, particularly needed and urgent is because we're seeing the virus spreading um, along uh, Southern America. So it was, uh, as Diane mentioned before, detected uh, several months ago in, in North America, but uh, it's been slowly or quickly, I don't know, depending on the perspective we're, we're taking, uh, spreading down south. And um, there has been huge outbreaks in both poultry farms and um, wildlife, notably in Peru and Chile. And some uh, strong examples are, for instance, some massive uh, die-offs of uh, pelicans, kind of like we've been observing, for instance, in Scotland with the gannets and the squirrels, where uh, it was hundreds of dead birds um, stranded on on the coast. Uh, another example that has, uh, that has got the scientific community quite worried is that it was also detected in uh, sea lions, so a mammal species. So there have been uh, different instances where we found the virus in mammals. So for instance, in the UK, we found it in um, otters and foxes. Um, in North America, it's been found in um, things like uh, harbor seals, um, also some uh, Mammal like bears, for instance. But the specificity of what happened in Peru with the sea lions is that the outbreak killed about 500 animals, uh, so 500 individuals. And so there is a question of whether all those individuals got infected from the birds around, for instance, from dead pelicans that were around, or whether the virus was able to transmit between the sea lions, so infected a few sea lions to start with and then spread within the sea lion population which would mean that the virus is able to spread between two individuals within a, a, a mammalian species, um, which is uh, like yeah, quite worrying regarding the potential pandemic, human pandemic risk uh, for this virus. Uh, but again, like at this stage, it's just a hypothesis we're putting on the table. We, we don't know exactly what happened, but that's where, um, as Diane was mentioning, genetic data can be very useful. Because uh, if we can uh, see if the, all the Syrians are sharing the same strain of the virus, uh, or on the contrary, if they have all been exposed to different strains, that would help us understand whether they infected one another. And uh, like following uh, those lines, there are uh, there has also been a human case in South America. It, it can infect people and it can cause serious disease. Um, so that's another reason why we're looking at biosecurity measures and we're handling the virus in high containment facilities when, when we do experiments. That's because it can infect people and cause serious disease. In my view, this really highlights the value of surveillance, the fact that this is being picked up. But though there is still a lot of these unanswered questions, as you say, where in terms of is it multiple introductions into the mammalian species or is that onward, is a mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmission happening? And you mentioning about the different 
perhaps interaction between different clades or different variants as I'm seeing parallels with, say um, SARS-CoV-2 with the different perhaps Omicron variants, et cetera. It's previous infection history, how does that impact the p transmission potential or outbreak potential of uh, a future variant? So across public health, veterinary health, I think there's many, many parallels that can be drawn yeah. in this. In addition to those things, we're doing exactly what uh, Diane was mentioning before uh, regarding the ecology of the birds. So trying to understand um, how the birds move between different islands, so notably whether there are birds moving between the South American continent and uh, Southern uh, Ocean Islands like the Falklands. Uh, targeting, for instance, migratory species. So that's related to uh, what Ben was mentioning regarding uh, identifying the potential um, long distance carriers uh, and like vectors for introduction um, that migratory birds can be. Um, and um, yeah, looking at what, how we could expect the virus to potentially come. And if it does come, what we can what kind of data we can collect to understand how it came. So building, uh, building capacities there to make sure if the virus arrives, we can collect the right data, so notably genetic sequences, to try to uh, trace back where it came from. So whether it came from uh, South America or whether it came through a migratory bird that came straight up from um, the northern hemisphere and so on. Many thanks, Anna, being for the overview from the South America's perspective. Moving from the Americas back to across to Europe, and so earlier on you have heard an overview of the situation within Great Britain, uh, but now I've chatted with Marisa Seal and looking at kind of perhaps mainland Europe perspective. How is the what's the current HPAI situation? For uh, for in comparison with uh, North America, I think the situation is uh, the situation is worst, and from the uh, livestock industry perspective. Uh, since 2021, uh, fall 2021, the virus has been detected in more than 2,000 farms in Europe, uh, mainly in, the, in Great Britain, but also in France, Belgium and Hungary. And so as a response, uh, we, um, the Europe uh, has been um, killed about 50 million um, poultry, uh, to prevent the transmission of the virus between between farms, uh, I mean uh, close farms between each other. So when there is an outbreak to to mitigate the the, the epidemic, uh, there is like some uh, some prevention that are uh, common to the to the countries in uh, in Europe. And uh, another thing that is is be uh, worried in Europe is that avian influenza is uh, is normally seasonally, so it appears during the winter. But normally the virus, the infection de decreases during summer. But uh, since 2021, we didn't see um, a, f a big difference between the two waves. So that was also uh, concerning for for Europe. And also, uh, in January 2023, uh, the virus has been detected in a mink farm, and the, the strong assumption and it's going to be confirmed, it's probably will be confirmed, uh, is that the virus has been transmitted from mammals to mammals. So, as uh, Amandine explained, is uh, it's a bit concerning that we are close closer to uh, the transmission to, to human in, in, in this case. So, well, that's for the, uh, for the livestock, uh, from the livestock industry perspective. And also in the wild, uh, in the wild birds, uh, of course, we have been detected uh, also a lot of this, uh, of this virus. And um, so in Europe, it's, uh, it's known that the virus is introduced in farms thanks to the uh, wild birds, uh, which carry normally the low pathogenic uh, avian influenza. So that's why we say it's, uh, it's seasonally, because it's, uh, it happens with, uh, with the migration of, of birds. So avian influenza has been detected also in wild bird species. Uh, like I think since 2022, it has been detected 600 times in, in wild bird uh, animals. 
uh, in one of those uh, individuals. You hit a crucial point there with the yeah, situation in the UK has been, yeah, also seeing over the summer of like 2022 there being like, uh, infection being retained within like domestic seabird populations for the first time, and that's been unprecedented. Yeah, and actually, if we if we go back uh, just a little bit in the in late 2021, we already had a few rare cases here and there. Um, so, for instance, there were some uh, great squirrels, uh, a few individuals, you know, maybe like three or five uh, that died in northern Scotland uh, and were tested uh, as positive for avian influenza um, at this stage, but it didn't blow up at the time, like it stayed just a few dead individuals. Might be a question of timing because the breeding season was almost finished, so there were not as much birds in the as many birds in the colonies as you would have at the peak of the breeding season. Um, and then it looks like uh, it came back the year after, but I don't know if it came back stronger or if it came back just at the right time. And then that's when the the big outbreak that that we uh, are talking about right now um, uh, happened. And Marie Cecile, uh, so with ULB, you also are working with FAO. Um, so what's happening with that collaboration? Yes, so we've been working with FAO for a few months, but they have started uh, a project uh, um, one year uh, ago about uh, developing an early warning tool for uh, yeah for alert- alerting uh, about the uh, the risk of uh, transmission of introduction of avian influenza in poultry farms. So we uh, so they have been developed some interface maps. So these maps are. Uh, is to identify the hotspots where wild birds are the most in contact with uh, poultry uh, poultry farms, and uh, so the goal is uh, and uh, our part is to help us to to develop the the distribution uh, of wild bird species, which is uh, quite challenging uh, because we do not have so much extensive data about the wild bird distribution and also about their movements depending on the season. And also there have been um, uh, some changes in the migration because of the climatic changes. So it's it's becoming um, a, a challenge for, for special modeling uh, about, the, about the wild bird species distribution. So we are... Uh, yeah, as uh, in ULB, we are helping us, helping us to helping them. Sorry, to 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 develop this tool and this uh, and the application in the future is mainly to help um, uh, countries, uh, developing countries, to alert about the the risk of uh, of the avian influenza introduction, um, because this is uh, one of it's an important economic income for uh, for developing countries. Uh, so if they if they have a lot of losses, it can be dramatic in terms of uh, uh, economic losses for for these countries. And as Europe is uh, has some flyways of wild birds between yeah Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. So when we detect the the disease in in Europe. We can alert the uh, the other countries, and we can uh, uh, try to prevent the propagation of of the disease. So cheers, Marisa Sale, for the overview. There. That's, that's very insightful and helpful. And to to conclude, it would be great to get people's viewpoints and perspectives as to as the prominent challenges that you think is are being faced in you know, this area of research. Uh, perhaps initially thinking about that data gaps or knowledge gaps and what challenges are being faced within data collection at this time? I was going to say that um, I think that one of the big challenges in data collection in the disease world in general is uh, the way, trying to uh, standardize the way that data is collected and the sharing of data across platforms, which is a huge task when we talk about the many, many different people, organizations, countries, state level, uh, province level, the ways that 
people are gathering the information that we need to inform us on these problems is widely disparate. So um, trying to get people together, and again, I think this is something that is largely improving over time, but trying to get people together to uh, to work together in trying to collect things in a way that a larger group of researchers can use that data rather than collecting data with a singular uh, output in mind um, or an output that can be used within a singular framework, trying to gather data and output that can be used within many different types of frameworks um, is one of the big challenges that we're facing. I would say that um, birds don't know political borders and uh, we are really now globally connected uh, for this uh, virus question. So there are regions of the globe where this type of virus has become endemic, and there's a question parts of Asia or the, the Mideast, um, uh, parts of Africa, uh, Europe, it's a question, has it become endemic now? There are some studies that say maybe it has, and they're, they're looking at that. In North America, the question is, will it become endemic? And what does this mean for... Um, uh, economics for agriculture? What does this mean for some of our threatened uh, wild bird species that um, are not typical host reservoirs of low path viruses? Um, we're getting, being based in the U.S., uh, we're getting reach out from Canada, from many countries in South America, and these networks are are not fully developed. So um, I think one we can we can learn from other parts of the globe on what has been happening there, uh, but enacting the the ground structure for having um, more surveillance systems um, for having communication even within the wild and um, agricultural side, but but soon to be you know connections with the, the the human public health side because we do not know if this will become a, a human pandemic or not. Um, as far as data collection, there are never enough resources. And right now in, in the U.S., we have a, a well-standing um, active surveillance program. We also have um, that, that looks focuses mainly on waterfowl. We also have a passive surveillance system that looks at mortalities in typically other species that might be affected differently. And so now with the, the changing of this virus, do we need to change our current surveillance system so that we can get more of the genetics to understand more about the, the evolution of the virus and what does it mean um, for the potential spread and possible endemicity of the virus? I appreciate the input on that. And that's, that's a very pertinent and pressing problems that hopefully we'll be make, make some progress on in upcoming years. And from my own perspective as a as a modeler, the, the issues in terms of openness of data and then thinking about how working in tandem, data streams are in a format which are amenable for use in modeling frameworks that are developed. And then from the outputs of the models that can inform what should the next round of data collection be doing to help try to reduce the uncertainty that we have in our system. And so to me, this like the one health approach to me seems a very important way to go where we're trying to like mitigate uh, kind of the risks of like potential crises that originate at this interface between uh, humans animals and the environment and so is there any other thoughts about perhaps challenges within modeling or just kind of future vision and yeah so one of the you know big questions for uh, for the future for europe and for the rest of the world is whether the virus is actually going to become endemic now in the seabird population or in the poultry or at the interface between the two maybe they keep um infecting one another uh and yeah so that's the yeah the kind of question i think that going to keep uh, people busy uh, but one of the uh, i think way forward to address that question and things that are already being put in place is uh, I see now a, a really like a, a way stronger uh, collaboration between the you know people who are uh, traditionally working only on farm animals and on the other side people who are only working on wildlife epidemiology that are 
te teaming up uh, to address that uh, question right now. You know, it's it's a it's a bad uh, situation. Like no one wished uh, that would have happened. But I think it's uh, like this is a really strong case study for the One Health concept, where we see that we have uh, infectious disease um, that potentially very likely emerged uh, in a domestic animal environment, in a farming environment, uh, that now has impact for you know obviously the farmed animals, uh, but also for wildlife. And also through the impact on, on farming on humans, because, you know, here we are questioning uh, also human health questions, both for the um, uh, human pandemic risk uh, aspect, but also for the food safety uh, aspect. Um, yeah, if we have big outbreaks in, in poultry farms, whether it's in North America or um, where we have huge uh, uh, poultry farms uh, and, you know, as was mentioned before, when you have an outbreak, you actually have to remove the infected individuals and their potential contacts. So we're talking about uh, yeah, billions of uh, birds being killed as a response to the outbreak. For me, one of the main challenge in, uh, challenges in, in modeling is for sure connected to data. Because as, as you explained, uh, we do not have so much data and we do not have standardized data between countries, between regions. And this is uh, one of the main challenges for, for modeling because before uh, trying to understand how the epidemic can spread, we need to have accurate data about the distribution, uh, about the, where are the animals, uh, when are they living, uh, how many times do they stay. So for sure that is one of the challenge and this is what, what we try to, to, to accomplish in, uh, in, in the ULB is to, to develop a model to have accuracy distribution of, uh, of livestock, but also uh, now we try to we develop models of, uh, of uh, farms distribution. So to have the, to see how the, the clustering of farms can affect the, the, the speed of, uh, of the transmission of, uh, of a disease in a, in a system. So for me, that would be one challenge because we need uh, special temporal data that uh, we do not have uh, completely uh, for some for some region. And for sure, in the country that would be the most affected uh, economically by this kind of uh, of outbreaks, we do not. It's the, are the countries where we do we don't have so much data, actually. So. This is uh, well one of the challenge in, in modeling for, for the future. So I think we need to, to work with more with, uh, uh, with governments and organization to, to have um, a common project about uh, data collection and as you said, standardized uh, the data to, to make uh, easiest to use. Another challenge from the modeling perspective, which is something that's been a little bit touched on, but the idea that host differences in hosts matter and that a mallard is a duck, but not all ducks are mallards. And a lot of what we know about ducks comes from, say, studies in mallards, but there is a huge wealth of biodiversity of birds in the world. And to try to model avian influenza movement just based on one species or type of duck is not necessarily going to recreate all of the global dynamics that we are now observing with these new developments in high pop avian influenza. And um, trying to capture differences between ducks in terms of behavior and range and difference is that might come from modeling other types of birds like shorebirds, seabirds, uh, could potentially improve our ability to predict how this virus is going to spread and act in the future, but trying to harness those many, many different species of bird, differences in birds, physiological differences, uh, and how they respond differently to the virus in terms of their pathogenicity, in terms of how they might react to being infected, um, 
it's a lot to try to uh, get at all of these potentially very important aspects. And again, goes back to the lack of data that we have for many, if not most, of the species of interest now, um, as far as the current strain of high path avian influenza goes. Diane, any closing for? Yeah, I'd say a uh, vision for the future um, to tackle uh, this challenge. I think that we all need to come together um, across the globe as well as across disciplines. So um, I've been working with folks um, across the globe for the past 18 years on related questions and more and more working with, I'm a, you know, a wild bird ecologist and a spatial modeler, but it's imperative to work with virologists, microbiologists, remote sensing scientists uh, to pull all of these um, large scale, fine scale uh, pieces of data related to the, the wild birds or the agricultural side, the disease side uh, together. So, um, and it's becoming a little bit easier to do that these days. So looking forward to more collaborations. And with that, I'd just like to say many thanks to, to you all for your contribution today. It's been terrific to speak with you all. Thanks. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. And we hope you will join us again next time for our next episode of Spider Presents.